Hey everyone, Warix here. Welcome back to the Monk Academy. We are here now officially in our final spec, Windwalker Monk. Now, for those of you that have not been sure, like what the hell am I talking about when I say the Monk Academy? So I've been doing a series of videos, three on each spec that go over different aspects of each spec. So I started with Brewmaster Monk, moved to Mistweaver Monk, and now we're closing with Windwalker Monk. So in video one, we go over the spells and abilities. We talk about your main passive, and then also a lot of your uh, main core abilities, your defensives, your niche abilities, your mobility, your utility, things of that nature. And then uh, we will go over, uh, in a second video, we'll start talking about the talents, what talents I think are mandatory, what talents I think are niche, what talents are fit for like certain build types, that sort of thing. And then in a third video, we do a rotation video, general approach to stats, and then we want to talk about uh, just some tips and tricks that I've learned playing Monk over the course of the last, what, six years or so. So uh, a few disclaimers. This video guide is intended for beginners. If you are an experienced Monk player, you're probably not going to get a lot out of this, and that is okay. So this is intended for people that are new to Monk, that have never played Windwalker before, and are curious as to try and figure out what we're doing. Now, in this first video, we're going to talk about spells and abilities. Yes, that means we're going to be reading a lot of tooltips. But what I hope I can do for you is help build a connection between why some of these abilities are important, why some of these abilities are considered core, what things you really need to be on the lookout for. And hopefully that'll help like speed up your learning curve in a way that you wouldn't get by just like reading a wildhead guide or playing the spec and kind of flailing in the dark blind. So that's the goal with this video. And so let's go ahead and just dive right into it. And we're going to start with your mastery here, which I start with passives in all these videos. Now, a lot of these passives are uh, our talents and stuff like that. So we are going to um, be on the lookout for uh, we're going to be on the lookout for uh, the main one here. And then we're going to talk about this one as well because it does have some value as well. The rest of these are all talent passives, so we're not going to go too deep into them because we'll talk about them when we go over the talent tree. So your mastery is combo strikes. This basically means that your abilities deal more damage when they are not a repeat of the previous ability. So one of the things that makes Windwalker Monk a very unique playstyle in World of Warcraft is that you are actually uh, not spamming abilities. In fact, doing so hurts you. So you have specs like Frost DK, for example, that wants to hit as many obliterates as humanly possible. And if you hit two or three in a row, that's ideal. This is not like, uh, you know, Fury Warrior, where when you're in a Raging Blow build, you're constantly dumping your Rage and Blow charges because that's your most efficient way to generate rage. When Walker Monk is not that, it actually incentivizes uh, a diverse gameplay loop. Now, because of that, Windwalker Monk is very much what I call a rhythm spec. That once you find your rhythm with the spec and you start to feel like you're comfortable with it, you become very, you know, you become very adept at finding it, ideally. I'm not the greatest at it, but once you find become adept at finding your rhythm pretty quickly, you can really start to just the if you really start to feel like your fingers get a muscle memory to them in a way that other specs don't where you're doing a lot more spamming. However, the other side to this is that if you f uh, screw up that rhythm, then you drop your mastery, which means, I mean, I'm talking right now, my current stats, you're talking almost 43% damage off my abilities being lost simply because I screw up the rhythm. So it really punishes you harshly for losing that rhythm. Now, Mastery for Monk, uh, Windwalker Monk, it's unique. And so I think because of that, it's probably never going to change. But it's dependent on how it scales and what tuning they do to it. Sometimes it's not a very valuable stat. Other times it's a pretty valuable stat. So it's, it's weird uh, when you're looking at secondary stats. We'll talk more about that in video three. Let's talk about Combo Breaker. Combo Breaker basically means that every time you use your Tiger Palm, you have a chance to make your Blackout Kick cost no chi. Now this does have a logo, it goes right here, uh, and it's just the, a black like crescent that goes right here. Uh, so that way you have the ability to be able to know when you have this proc. Um, because it is a proc, you know, it is something that you want to use somewhat often. Now Blackout Kick does have other engagements throughout the tree, but 
because of talent setups rather. Um, but it is one that you want to kind of keep a close eye on. Obviously, you want to use it when you can because it makes blockout kick free and it can contribute to your mastery strikes. Um, the rest of this stuff is, like I said, it's all passive. So we're not really going to be talking about that. Or it's all in the talent tree. So we're not really going to be talking about that. So let's talk about your core ability. Your core damage rotation is kind of revolves around two categories. There's chi generators and then there's chi spenders. Now, Woodwalker Monk has undergone some changes in the beta and alpha builds to where your chi generators have been significantly reduced. Expel Harm is no longer uh, a chi generator for you. As you can see, it's not even in active ability anymore in this tree. As you can see right here, it's passive. So I can actually remove that from my bar. Uh, and then Chi Burst actually no longer generates Chi as well. So you only really have one true Chi generator, and that is Tiger Palm, which costs 55 energy in the build that I'm in now, but generally it's 50 to 55. Uh, and then it deals you know, damage and then generates two Chi. Occasionally will generate three. So... What that means is that really you want to rotate using Tiger Palm and then your cheese spenders. Now let's talk about your main cheese spenders. And the first one I think we need to hit on is Rising Sun Kick. So Rising Sun Kick, single target damage, does a truckload of it. Physical damage, reducing the effectiveness of healing on the target. So it does give you a, uh, a mortal strike effect, which can be useful depending on the encounter. And it's just a way to allow your, you know, it's really kind of like in single target. It's the second best way, really, to spend your chi, mainly because there's another ability that we'll talk about here in just a second that is much more powerful. Um, but this is a very, very powerful ability. There's a lot of things in your talent tree and in your kit that kind of play off of Rising Sun Kick as well. Uh, so just a really good way to spend your chi. You want to be spending this often. Strike of the Windlord, I would say, is your most powerful Chi Spender right now. Because it does have a 30 second cooldown, does cost 2 Chi, but it strikes with both fists. As you can see at my stat numbers right now, it's doing almost 340,000 damage, reduces the movement speed by an additional 50%. And then through talents here, through Gale Force and Communion with Wind, it's got some other things that make it just extremely powerful. So this is a very good... Uh, one, I would say if it's up and you have two chi to spend, this is how you want to spend it in single target or in AoE situations. It is just very powerful. Now I mentioned Blackout Kick. Let's talk about it real quick. So Blackout Kick is one chi, so it's a much more efficient spender in terms of chi efficiency, but it's not as powerful from a damage perspective. But it does have some interesting interactions to kind of make up for that. So it doesn't deal a ton of damage. As you can see, it does only about 28,000 damage at my stats. Uh, but when you use Blackout Kick, it reduces the cooldown of Rising Sun Kick, which I think baseline is 10 seconds. Through my haste, it has 8.3. And Fist of Fury, which is a baseline 20 second cooldown. Now, Fist of Fury, we'll talk about in a second, but Blackout Kick definitely, I would say of your Chi Spenders, it's the lowest priority to use. Uh, but sometimes it can jump ahead of Fist of Fury in like single target situations. And when you get your uh, blackout kick proc, this is going to be the way that you want. You know, obviously you want to go ahead and use them if you haven't just blackout kicked. And then finally, there's Fist of Fury. Fist of Fury is a three cheese spender, so it is the most expensive cheese spender. Um, but it does big cone damage, 156,000 in my stats to the primary target, with basically half of that to all other enemies over. For me, it's about three and a half seconds right now. Uh, you can move while you're channeling this. Um, there are different ways that Fist of Fury interacts. In AoE situations, obviously, it has a ton of value because it does a lot of AoE damage. In single target, there are only certain times, really, that you want to use it. But we'll go diving into that more into the rotation section uh, in that video. But Fist of Fury is a very good way to uh, channel, you know, in, in full channeling it over three seconds, it gives you like a three full seconds worth of energy regeneration, too. So Fist of Fury can be like, if you have high chi, low energy, it's a good way to spend this, get a lot of damage out, but then also have energy to immediately tiger palm back in once you go through. Because your basic core rotation is you're tiger palming into a spender, tiger palm into a spender, tiger palm into a spender. Now that's very generic. There's obviously very specific situations when you're talking about your chi count, 
but that's kind of the generic rhythm play that you play is that you're bouncing Tiger Palm off of a spender and building and developing that way. So it plays in a way like, you know, Feral Druid and Rogue do, which are the classes that are the most closely aligned from a resource framework of energy and combo points. Here it's ener you know, energy and chi. Um, but because your stuff has flat chi cost and doesn't scale with the number of combo points you have or chi points that you have, it's a little bit different. So like there's that idea that's really in place, but with a nice unique twist. Let's also talk about spinning crane kick. This is a also an AOE uh, channel cost two chi for Windwalker Monk. Um, basically, you want to use this in uh, AOE type situations. Now, the second paragraph on this is very important. Spinning Crank Kicks damage is increased by 18% for each unique target you've struck within the last 20 seconds with Tiger Palm, Blackout Kick, or Rising Sun Kick. So, what happens in AOE situations is that you find yourself in a position where you are not wanting to just immediately run in and spinning Crank Kick. You actually want to use some of your other abilities to basically set up your spinning crane kick. So there's a little bit of like ramp in your AOE. Um, they've announced some changes where things like Storm Earth and Fire, which we'll talk about in a minute, um, can help with that. And they made some ch a really stupid change, in my opinion, to shadow boxing treads, allegedly. But we'll talk more about that in the talent video. So that's kind of like your core abilities. It's Tiger Palm is your main builder, and then Depending on situation, it's Strike of the Windlord, Rising Sun Kick, Blackout Kick, Fist of Fury, and Spinning Crane Kick. You have five spenders. So it's kind of like the reverse of Ret Paladin in a way, where Ret Paladin has like four or five builders and then only like two spenders. Windwalker Monk, it's the inverse thought process where you only have one true builder, but then a bunch of different ways to spend it depending on the situation. All right. Uh, let's go ahead and talk about your cooldowns. So your cooldowns really come down to uh, three of them, four of them, really. But let's talk about your big ones. Let's start with Invokes UN. Invokes UN is your celestial for Windwalker Monk. So basically, you summon a white tiger that attacks your target. Um, and then every, it does a little bit of cleave damage as well. Um, every four seconds, your Zhuen and strikes enemies empowered with White Tiger Lightning, which deals 8% of the damage you have dealt to those targets in the last four seconds. So it really does a lot of damage when you can get a fat Fist of Fury off or a fat Spinning Crane Kick off or a huge Strike of the Windlord off. There is some like really intricate gameplay loops that you can try to min-max out of Zhuen. But for you as a beginner or even an intermediate level player, pop this on cooldown. When you get it, use it. It's just a very, very powerful cooldown. Uh, very good cooldown, does a lot. Uh, we'll jump to other targets. If you attack a different target, it will follow whatever target you're hitting. Storm Earth and Fire. This is a one and a half minute recharge, so your cooldowns aren't always going to be synced, um, even though you can sometimes hold them to make sure that they are. So basically what happens is you sp uh, summon three elemental spirits for 15 seconds, and each spirit deals 40% uh, of the damage and healing that you do. You can control them to where you can either, like by default, they just kind of attack whatever's closest to them. But if you want them to focus on one target, you basically hit the Storm Earth and Fire button again while they're active and it'll focus all three targets onto one mob. Right. Um, Storm Earth and Fire, one of the things that the Elemental Spirits do also is that they are a kind of form of threat reduction uh, because even though everything is you're like your threat is split out amongst all your elementals, even though it's only the threat that you generate. So it's interesting in that it can be a, a threat generate uh, a threat managing tool. It's not something I would think about, but just something to be aware of. Uh, but Storm Earth and Fire, even though it feels like in while you're doing Storm Earth and Fire, each of your abilities feels like it's hitting for less. Like you might hit for like 250k on a Rising Sun Kick, but while Storm Earth and Fire is active, your Rising Sun Kick might only hit for like you know, 175k, but your three clones are also then hitting at like a hunt, you know, 80k each. It's a net damage gain. So Storm Earth and Fire is, is very interesting. It's kind of historically been a little bit buggy. But um I love Storm Earth and Fire. I am a big fan of it versus something like Serenity, which basically made it so that you resource capped all the time. Storm Earth and Fire, it doesn't give you uh, the resource issues that Serenity did. 
um, but it does still have some really nice and interesting gameplay loops that you can min-max as you see fit. Those are your, ma your big two cooldowns. Let's talk about a couple of smaller ones. Obviously, we talked about Strike of the Windlord already. I think that's a core ability, even though it's on a cooldown. Let's talk about Whirling Dragon Punch. So Whirling Dragon Punch is back. Um, if you played Shadowlands, you know that Whirling Dragon Punch is around. Um, but in Dragonflight, Whirling Dragon Punch fell out of favor. Well, Blizzard decided that they didn't like us not taking Whirling Dragon Punch because they'd made not quite a wholesale rework to it, but they did a lot to Whirling Dragon Punch to make it very powerful again. Now, I've been a Whirling Dragon Punch lover, so I'm okay with this, but I know there are a lot of people that really hate this ability. But basically what it does is that you perform a devastating uh, Whirling Upward Strike, you deal damage to your nearby enemies uh, and do that, but it's only usable when both Fist of Fury and Rising Sun Kick are on cooldown. So it's a trigger ability, which is why it has this... Um, which is why it has this aspect of uh, what I why it's, I kind of dub it a a cooldown here. So let me just come over here, not to the tank dummy. Uh, let's come here to this training dummy. So basically, I'm not doing this ideally, but right here you can see it procs, and then you boop boop boop, and it does damage. Now the big thing about Whirling Dragon Punch is that it kind of animation locks you uh, while you're doing the actual animation itself so it can sometimes troll you but overall like the ability just does a ton of damage like i mean you saw i just cast one and it did three hundred sixty-four thousand damage and that was on a single target like it just it does a lot it just really does so it's a very very powerful ability uh anytime you have both those spenders off like, if Whirling Dragon Punch is off cooldown, you want to get Fist of Fury and Rising Sun Kick on cooldown so that you can use this pretty quickly. Now, again, it does animation lock you, so sometimes it can be a little weird. There are some uh, things with, like, lighter than air that you can do to, to tweak it. But, again, for beginner purposes, if a Swirly is about to drop, don't use Whirling Dragon Punch. You're going to kill yourself. And finally, Cheeverse. So Cheeverse went from kind of, like, a weird... Uh, Thing in the tree that was like a interesting but like awkward sometimes to use chi generator to being a proc ability that still has like its weird cast time on it so it's like it's still an awkward ability but it hits really hard now so basically when you instead of chi burst being like you can see right now it's it's grayed out right here that's basically when i do abilities it's gonna proc up and it'll light up on your bars i have a thing that will pop up right here on my weak aura package that i use here it tells me when I can use Chi Burst, and that's when you want to go ahead and try to use it. Now, it does have a 40-yard range, so you want to be mindful about your positioning on it because you can sometimes uh, cause your uh, cause it to pull other packs, so you just want to be mindful. But it does a lot of damage now. it got a huge damage buff uh, across the board for all three specs, so still does like very, very well. All right. Let's talk about your defensive abilities. And we'll start with your big one, of course, Fortifying Brew. Basically, this is a one and a half minute cooldown. You can, well, it's a two minute baseline, but then you can take a talent to make it one and a half minutes. Uh, basically, it gives you 20% maximum health and 20% DR for 15 seconds. Very, very powerful cooldown. Very, very good cooldown now that they've not made it like a six minute baseline cooldown reduction. Um, it's just really, really good. Anytime you're gonna be taking a big hit that maybe isn't like Diffuse Magic specific, uh, this is a really, really good one to use. I mentioned Diffuse Magic. Let's talk about Diffuse. So Diffuse Magic is a specific magic damage reduction by 60% for 6 seconds. Um, the transfer currently a harmful magical effects on you back to the original caster, if possible, is a little bit niche. That's much more PvP related. Although there are some ways where you can basically cleanse yourself with this debuff. Now, I don't have the full list of what that's going to be in a War Within. I'm sure someone in Peak of Serenity... Uh, the Discord or the website will figure out all the diffuse stuff that we can do, and we'll make a giant spreadsheet, as is generally the case. Um, and once that's made up and I find it or it's linked to me or whatever, you know, I can maybe make a video about it. But uh, just know that really what you want to use diffuse magic for is that if you have a big magic hit that's coming your way, you can use diffuse to reduce that damage. Your third is Touch of Karma. 
Touch of Karma absorbs all damage that you take by 10 seconds up to 50% of your maximum health and redirects 70% of that amount back to targets as nature damage. Now, Touch of Karma is a little bit interesting because you can technically use it as damage where you want to like stand in a mechanic in order to do the damage back. Now, that's gameplay I generally don't encourage. You want to use it almost purely as a defensive. So like if there's AoE damage going out, you Touch of Karma. Now, the big thing about Touch of Karma is that it's... A deep, it's actually a, a debuff on your target. So if that target dies while your Touch of Karma is still active on it, you lose your Karma. So it's really, really finicky, and you have to be mindful about it. But it is something that, like, it is a, it's a pretty powerful one, and it obviously gives you, uh, you know, it's a pretty big absorb. Like, right now, for me, it would be, it's, it's about a 700,000 absorb. So it's a very good... Uh, and with health pools spiking the way that they are in the War Within, this is only going to become even more powerful. Um, so yeah, that's your main defensive toolkit. Let's talk about your mobility. Obviously, roll. Roll roll a short distance. You have maximum three charges with it, with a talent setup that you get. It's pretty common right now. Um, it's just really good. You know, you can, you know, you're just rolling around. And then I have lighter than air, which we'll talk about in the talent section. Yeah, you get three charges of this. It's on like a uh, 10 to 12 second cooldown timer. So it's a pretty, you know, 17 second recharge rather. So you get a lot of charges of it with three three roll charges. It's quite good. Transcendence. Transcendence I've talked a lot about before. But basically what Transcendence does is it puts your spirit in a place. And there are talents that affect this. But you can basically put your spirit somewhere. And as you run away from like a mob or from a mechanic. And you want to get, say the mob's right here. You want to get back to it you swap places with it. So very, very good tool. I'll probably make a whole video on really good transcendence places in all of the eight dungeons of Mythic Plus Season 1 and in the raid. All right, and then we have Flying Serpent Kick. So Flying Serpent Kick is Windwalker specific. You saw me use it just a little bit ago. You switch basically soar through the air for one and a half seconds. Um, now you can cancel it. So you can obviously fly all the way across, but if you get to where you want to go sooner than that, then you have the opportunity to cancel it out. Now I got to wait for it to come back, but uh, so you do have the ability, like if you fly too far, you can cancel it early. So it does allow for uh, you to have some mobility skill expression. Uh, this makes Windwalker Monk one of the most mobile melee DPS, especially now that you get the third roll of charge. You can take Bounding Agility to make your roll go further. You have Lighter Than Air, which gives you a little bit of the dash. You have Tiger's Lust as well, which is kind of a utility one. We'll talk about that here in just a second. And then you have Flying Serpent Kick. That's four ways for you to move about the map and move about an encounter. You're extremely mobile as a Windwalker, and it does feel pretty good. All right. So let's talk about Tiger's Lust because it's kind of in that combination mobility utility section. So it's going to kind of transition us between those two. So Tiger's Lust uh, basically increases your movement speed by 70% for six seconds and removes all roots and snares. It can be used on yourself or on a party member, a raid member. It has a 30 second cooldown, so you can use it somewhat often. Um, Tiger's Lust is just really good. Uh, it's a really, really good ability. I would recommend having like a keybind or a mouse over macro so you can quickly use it on other targets. You think of anything that roots you, think of like, for example, the tendril roots, you can break yourself out of it. You think of the uh, time sync debuff from Chrono Lord Dios in Uldaban Legacy of Tear. You can actually Tiger's Lust that off. Uh, so there's a lot of ways that you can remove these roots and snares off of yourself and just keeps you really, really mobile. Very, very good. And because it can be used on other players, it also works as utility. Uh, I'm going to backtrack one second because I just saw this. Touch of Death. This is your is another cooldown. Um, you exploit the enemy's weak point, instantly killing the creature if it has less than health, less health than you. Um, deals damage equal to 35% of your maximum health against players or stronger creatures than you that are under 15% health. And it spawns three cheese spheres when you walk through them. So when you touch of death, uh, touch of death has a unique thing for every spec. For Brewmaster, it's like a full stagger clear. For Windwalker, it's going to be three cheese spheres, which gives you a chi point when you do it. So if you don't kill a mob, or you kill one mob, but you still have others in your pack, you can actually walk around the cheese spheres that are in the game field and basically gain free resources. I don't rely on it as a way to, of resource generation, obviously, because it requires you to be towards the end of a fight. 
but at least it can give you that little bit of extra oomph so that you can get that rising sun kick or that strike of the wind lord or whatever the case may be going a little bit quicker all right now let's talk about utility uh so we're gonna start with leg sweep so leg sweep basically is a conal knocks enemies down and stuns them does everything for all enemies it's a big old aoe stop very very good to have on a one minute cooldown baseline but with some talents it can do a little bit be a little bit less uh, just really really good this is going to be really good mob control for you as a windwalker paralysis it's a single target stun lasts for a minute it's a good cc option if there's a mob that's casting in the back and isn't moving you can just paralysis it while you kill the rest of the mobs or wait on your tank to get them get the message and pull that mob in or go to that mob uh with certain talent builds in the War Within, it can also act as a soothe, which means it removes enrage effects. So if there's a mob that enrages, think of Rage Storm in Brackenhide Hollow, for example. That's an enrage effect. You can now paralysis that and soothe that effect off. Provoke is your taunt. There are some very rare cases where this will be useful, but it's not going to be greatly useful. Resuscitate is just your res. Uh, you do have a single target res as a Windwalker Monk, so if your healer dies and you're the only other res, you can actually res your healer without forcing them to do a run back. Ring of Peace. Basically what it does is that if you put this on a mob that is casting or is out of the group pack or you need to knock out of XYZ thing on the ground, then Ring of Peace allows you to do that. And there are some really interesting texts with Ring of Peace. Uh, I'm sure if you watch a lot of um a lot of like high-end windwalker players in pvp in particular they do some really fun ring of peace tricks but even in high-end mythic plus ring of peace can be a very clutch ability so it's really good at another form of mob control if you can't stun them you can leg sweep them or you can ring a piece them whatever the case may be spearhand strike is just your kick this is what's your interrupt have it on a comfortable keybind you're going to use it quite a bit and then you have Vivify. I put Vivify in Utility because basically you can heal yourself. It costs 30 energy. You can heal yourself or another target. Very, very simple. Um, overall, the... Uh, oh, I guess I should talk about these. Zen Flight basically just makes it so that you... Uh, do I have it on my... I don't have it on my... Where is it at? Oh, yeah. So basically Zen Flight, it, it doesn't replace a flying mount. But something that I actually learned, I've been playing Monk for six years. I learned this helping a guildmate of mine who was playing Monk for the first time. I'm going to die, right? I thought Zen Flight had a, a cast timer. It doesn't. And guess what? So, uh, guess what? Zen Flight now has some like niche use outside of in open world content now because if you fall off like a big cliff or you're trying to get down quickly you can just jump and then zen flight before you hit the ground uh it'd be useful on you know it's only usable outdoors actually it doesn't even say that like i'll have to test it so you have to test it the hard way but like you know zen flight a way to potentially just give you a way not to take fall damage so cool and then zen pilgrimage just takes you back to uh your home temple this is mainly really just the legion order hall uh, so yeah that is the windwalker spells and abilities so like as you can see like the core thing to take away from this is that windwalker is a rhythm spec you're going to be bouncing between your tiger palm as you're really your only generator and then your varying spenders the hardest thing about windwalker monk is knowing which spender to spend when and how to manage your chi it's really like you're almost like playing a game of math while you're also trying to Make sure that you aren't uh, breaking up and nerfing your own damage by hitting abilities twice in a row. So it's a really, really interesting gameplay loop that has a lot going on with it. Uh, so again, just to kind of prioritize the, the quick overall view, Tiger Palm is your main generator, and then Strike of the Windlord, Rising Sun Kick, uh, Fist of Fury, Spinning Crane Kick, Blackout Kick are your five spenders. You just have to learn how to prioritize those. And we'll talk more in the in the rotation section about when and how to prioritize these spells. You have a lot of mobility through Roll, through Tiger's Lust, through Flying Serpent Kick, and through Transcendence. You have some really excellent cooldowns in Touch of Death, Invoke Shuen, Storm Earth and Fire, um, Whirling Dragon Punch, and Chi Burst. Uh, really nice utility. You can uh, single target stun, AoE stun, soothe if you talent it. Cleanse yourself from poison of disease. 
Obviously, you have a melee kick, so you have a shorter kick time. Windwalker Monk uh, just has a lot that I think is going for it that's very, very positive. The thing that has kind of driven people away from playing Windwalker Monk in the past is that it is historically extremely buggy. And it's old gameplay loops before they did the rework for War Within um, really kind of pigeonholed the play style into stuff that wasn't really fun. Now they've really made a lot of really nice adjustments, particularly in the trees, which we'll talk about in the next video. But overall, like, this is just a really, really strong, like, gameplay loop and setup that it has. I just sometimes wish it wasn't overtly punishing for messing up and losing your, your mastery. Uh, but I, Windwalker is my favorite melee DPS in the game. Uh, and it's not, well, I won't say it's not close. There's some really fun melee for me. But, I mean, Windwalker Monkey is my favorite DPS in the game. Uh, and there's a lot of reasons to that. And I really hope that this helps help you build connections between, like, what abilities are important and things of that nature. So until the next video, all hope you all stay safe. Hope you enjoy yourself. You're having fun. You keep on gaming. We'll see you in Windwalker 302 Talents. Until next time.